Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sarah Robertson, and I'm the Communications and Special Projects Director at Colston Hall in Bristol. I'm here representing an organisation that has been dealing with an issue at the front line of inclusion and diversity. I want to talk about how sometimes making real change means doing something that's big, scary, and controversial. Sometimes taking the nuclear option and dealing with the fallout is the only way to make progress. Colston Hall, run by Bristol Music Trust, is the South West's largest concert hall. Since we left the control of our local authority in 2011, we have been on a journey, changing our programme from one that used to serve a predominantly white audience with events like wrestling, to one that is seen as one of the most innovative in the country, with a changing audience profile to match. Furthermore, our education and engagement work, especially with musicians who have special educational needs and disabilities, is a national exemplar at our level. Our city, Bristol, is the fastest growing city in the UK and one of the most diverse. 91 languages are spoken within its boundaries and 16% of Bristol citizens are classed as BAME. The city is also one of the most unequal in the country. The latest Runnymede report states that non-white Bristolians gain fewer academic qualifications in the city schools and find fewer opportunities in the local job market compared to the city's white communities. In recent years, Bristol has undergone profound cultural changes which has left our city questioning what it means to be a Bristolian and who we welcome into the city. Ironically, this multiculturalism is often cited as a huge factor in the current attractiveness of the city. In 2017, we were called one of Rough Guide's top 10 global cities. They said we are a small city that thinks like a big city. However, this thinking like a big city hasn't extended to addressing an issue that is at the centre of Bristol's politics and culture and is at odds with its free thinking attitude. In a society that is more politically and socially aware, it is an issue that is becoming more urgent to address and is one that our organisation is intrins intrinsically bound up in. The issue is slavery. Bristol is a city whose wealth, to a large extent, was created on the back of the transatlantic slave trade. Merchants in the city made huge profits from the trading of goods to Africa and the sale of captive Africans who were enslaved and sold to plantation owners in the Americas. Profits from goods produced on the plantations, such as coffee, sugar and tobacco came straight back to merchants in Bristol. The city benefited hugely from this triangular movement of enslaved humans and goods, fueling industries like banking, glass and tobacco production and made some families immensely wealthy. One of those made rich by this trade was Edward Colston. Born in 1636, he was an English merchant who saw the opportunity for making money that the trade in enslaved people and related goods afforded. In 1680, he became a member of the Royal African Company, which held the monopoly in Britain in the trading in gold, ivory, and people who were enslaved. By 1689, he was in its most senior position. Although there were other families in Bristol involved in the slave trade, Colston is the one we remember because he was a noted philanthropist, with the city being the main beneficiary. He founded almshouses in King Street and on St Michael's Hill, endowed schools, and even had a bun named after him. Even today, his name is a prominent feature of Bristol life, with streets, offices, and schools named after him. In 1895, a statue of him was erected in the city centre, which states, erected by citizens of Bristol as a memorial of one of the most virtuous and wise sons of their city. So, what do the events of 350 years ago have to do with the concert hall, whose previous most controversial stories were the Beatles being flower bombed on our stage, and Lemmy from Motorhead enjoying a smoke of a different kind in our dressing rooms? Our hall is one of the civic buildings that was given the name Colston. The hall as it currently stands was built in 1867. We've just celebrated its 150th birthday. This is about 150 years after Colston himself died and just before his statue was erected in the city centre. This commemoration was just what the civic leaders of the Victorian era did at the time, 
named the hall after the city's most famous and venerated benefactor. There was no Colston money put into the building or founding of Colston Hall. Our only connection with the man is his name above our door and on our website and brochures and tickets. But we have become part of the snowballing idea of rethinking how, who, and what we memorialize. In the US, Confederate, Confederate statues and memorials have become a hotbed of protest and re-evaluation. Oxford University students recently called for and failed to achieve the removal of the statue of the imperialist Cecil Rhodes at Oriel College. It is also true that Bristol has done less than other major cities such as Liverpool to address its difficult and controversial past. The historian, writer and Bristol resident David Olashoga stated in The Guardian in 2017, no British city is more willfully blind to its history than Bristol. He also said, the memory of Colston has become the front line in a battle for Bristol's historical soul. And the city's concert hall has become the lightning rod for this issue in a place which hasn't provided many other outlets for debate and re-evaluation. We had the disquiet and unease of a whole city placed squarely on our shoulders. I'm not an academic or a historian. I can't stand here and talk at a high level about what this means for our city and the wider context nationally and even internationally. But what I can do is speak about what being part of this debate has meant for our concert hall. We have had to think hard about our role now and in the future, and more importantly, what our audiences want us to be and do. What is our role as a civic building and cultural institution in these changing times? I've worked at Colston Hall for a long time, and throughout this time there has always been the desire to change our name. This feeling came much more to the fore in 2011 when we became Bristol Music Trust, and, in the words of our Chief Executive Louise Mitchell, started to become a grown-up arts organisation. It was a regular topic at trustee meetings and our senior managers always knew that we would need to confront the issue sooner rather than later. In the past, we always had the fixed point of our coming capital build as a moment to address the issue. In tw June 2018, we were closing for a two-year £48.8 million transformation of our main hall and historic lantern building. This seemed logically like the best time to address what we knew would be a controversial issue. We also knew that many of our audience members didn't want the hall to change its name. The hall has a fond place in the hearts of many Bristolians. They attended their first concert with us, had their first kiss under our awning, and even met their husband or wife on the dance floor. The name Colston is bound up in these highly personal histories, and it was hard to separate these feelings and memories from the name. In a poll in the Post, our local newspaper, in February 2017, Readers voted two to one to keep the name Colston. Our inboxes and post bag attested to this point of view. In hindsight, we should have been more proactive in dealing with the issue head on, speaking to communities and local leaders about our desire to change and bringing them on board. But we were nervous about signaling our intentions before we were ready. At this time, we still hadn't really owned the issue or made a conscious decision to take it on. Honestly, we were scared about dealing with something so big and the pressure of dealing with it alone had, had made us retreat from it even more. So, at the beginning of 2017, we were still under the name Colston. During this time, there was an undercurrent of low-level unrest with certain organizations and people in the city. We knew some high-level business leaders wouldn't come to our concerts because of the name. Our figures for BAME attendances were lower than we wanted which was attributed in part to people feeling shame and embarrassment about the name being used on our hall. And of course, we knew about the musician's massive attack, Bristol's biggest musical export, who very publicly said that they wouldn't perform at the city's main music venue when it was under the banner of a slave trader. In early 2017, two things happened to bring the issue more sharply into our focus. A long-serving and valued member of our staff team, who is black, told us that some of her family members won't come to the hall, her place of work, because of the name. Then came the protests. An organization called Countering Colston had been working in the city with the aim of redressing the imbalance of recognition and remembrance given to people like Colston over those who suffered as victims of the slave trade and those who are still suffering because of its legacy. 
We have been the target of protests many times over the years, but this one was different, more organised and went much wider, with most of the national newspapers and news outlets picking up on the story. For an organisation that wanted to change, dealing with a press crisis that lasted for a fortnight during our busiest period was hard, especially for staff who had to read the critical articles and respond to the negative social media posts. We rode the storm, but we could increasingly see that, in order to maintain credibility with our audiences and city, we had to move quickly. The name was becoming the elephant in the room, growing and growing, sucking out the air and clouding the rest of our good work. We knew that the time had come to confront the issue and plan to announce our intention to change. During the next few months, we worked across teams with comms consultant Jill Kirk and our PR agency to develop a strategy for announcing our name change and backing it up with action. How are we going to use this move to affect real and lasting change for our audiences, organization, and city? Our chief executive made the announcement in April 2017, backed by unanimous board support and in a room which included Paul Stevenson, the civil rights campaigner who led the Bristol, boycott in the 19, Bristol bus boycott in the 1960s and that led to the implementation of the first Race Relations Act. Louise's statement was clear. Bristol Music Trust had earned the right to remove the controversy and negative associations around the name and create a positive and forward-looking future for the Hall and the people of Bristol. She acknowledged that it is, a, it is an extremely emotive issue for a lot of Bristolians. We know some people won't like this move, but we must do what we're here for, to bring music to the people of Bristol and not be held back. She made it clear that the name Colston does not reflect our values as a progressive, forward-thinking and open arts organisation. She said that we wanted the whole city to be proud of its transformed concert hall, so it wouldn't be right to reopen the building using 48.8 million, some of which is public money, under the name Colston. The news went national and international, and the following days became some of the most challenging I and some of our staff team have ever experienced. Our social feeds were constantly scrolling with people commenting and reacting. Much of this comment was negative and in some cases offensive. The number of letters we received quadrupled overnight, with some regular attenders saying that they would never attend a concert at the hall again or give money to our transformation appeal. We were accused of erasing and censoring history. Couldn't we leave the name and use it to highlight and remember the city's past, no matter how unpleasant? For the record, we are talking about Colston and the name in an exhibition in our new Lantern building. Our argument, we are a music venue, not a monument. We were told that we were wrong to use the morals of today to judge the actions of the past. One letter commented, in Edward Colston's time, all business and domestic affairs relied on slaves and the slave trade. It was as much a part of life as Amazon is to us today. Vector63 commented on the Post's website site, this should be decided by the people of Bristol, not by some left-wing lobbies of the PC Brigade, known as the trustees. I bet but most were never even born in Bristol, are more than likely vegans and followers of Nick Clegg. We were accused of dredging up a past that people thought should rather be forgotten. We can laugh at some of these comments and reactions, but for us the fallout has had an immediate and ongoing impact on fundraising and advocacy in some groups in the city. But it was clear what we were doing was significant. An article in The Guardian quoted Nicholas Draper, director of the Centre for the Study of the Legacies of Bristol Slave Ownership at UCL. He said... The renaming of Colston Hall is probably the first significant change in the UK. There will be others. And that quote I mentioned earlier from David Olushoga, it actually finished like this. The memory of Colston has become the front line in a battle for Bristol's historical soul. This week, those lines shifted seismically. I think that like Brexit, what we did hit a nerve with people who are feeling disenfranchised with modern politics and culture with social media placing so much value on individual stories and opinions, those whose voices are not heard are pushed to the margins. For these people, it was never really about the name. We were taking away something that was important to them and they wanted their views to be heard. We became the focus of those missing voices on both sides of the argument. Actually, finding an outlet for these unheard voices sounds like the beginnings of an artistic strategy to me. 
Of course, everything I've just talked about isn't what really matters. What counts is what we do now. What action are we taking to use this change to really talk to our audiences and find out what kind of arts organisation they need us to be? Now, because we're all friends, I'm going to be honest with you again. We felt so battered and bruised by the reaction after our announcement that we didn't take action quickly enough. We had to retreat, take a deep breath and regroup. Now we're ready to take it on. We talk a lot in the arts about removing barriers to attendance. The name Colston acted as a symbolic barrier between our organisation and potential audiences, affecting our confidence to go out and speak to certain communities with honesty and on an equal footing. Now this barrier has been removed, we can really start to address a creative case for diversity in our organisation and make important changes to what we do. We're starting with the music, looking at our artistic policy to ensure our programme is diverse, welcoming and reflective of our city. For example, from this summer, we're taking our programme beyond the walls of the hall directly into the community we serve. We've commissioned a leading composer to write a major new opera for the reopening of the Transformed Hall, based on the journey of a refugee and using individual stories in the city. We also want to appoint a BAME creative producer to bring new insights to our programme. We're working with artistic partners like St Paul's Carnival and Bristol Old Vic to commission and develop work that reflects our city and looks to its positive future. And we're championing and developing upcoming ur urban artists through our multi-track inter-industry programme. We're being careful to listen to those who might feel angry about our name change. At our 150th birthday in September, we remembered the individual stories and celebrated the important role the Hall has played in our audience's personal histories. We have made a commitment to engage more with all our audiences and we'll be talking to them throughout our name change process to ensure it is transparent and representative. We want to reach audiences who might now feel we can be part of their cultural lives. Even more significantly, in September we are launching the National Centre for Inclusive Excellence. This is a national programme that will explore the civic role of music and the arts and their impact on individuals, communities and societies. It is supported by Youth Music, using funding from the National Lottery via Arts Council England. Our name change has had an impact across the city. Other arts organisations are thinking more deeply about inclusion and representation, and Colston's Primary School has debated the issue with their pupils, parents and teachers, and have taken the decision to change their name as well. We are determined to be part of these wider conversations. All this means that Bristol Music Trust is well placed to respond to issues raised in the Runnymede report. As a civic institution, we have a responsibility to take up the challenge of addressing inequities in our city. My organisation has had to get comfortable with the uncomfortable, with a history we'd rather not think about. Our wrestling with the issue mirrors that of the city making sense of the past and what it means in the present and future. Ours is an extreme example, but there are lessons for diversity and inclusion that everyone can take on board. Get ready for a list. Ignore communities at your peril. Listen to those whose voices are hidden. Be proactive and address any elephants in the room before they become too big to deal with. Ask for help. Who are your allies and how can they advocate for you? Don't carry the burden alone. And be clear about the story and your place within it. My final piece of advice would be this. If you have an issue that is as big and scary as ours, own it. If it's yours to deal with, it's yours to deal with. It's not going to go away as much as you wish it would. Trust me, I know. Take it on loudly and proudly. I'm standing here as proof that by taking the difficult path, you can come out the other side. Unscathed? Unfortunately not. Stronger and wiser? Without a doubt. <laughs>